Hello everyone and welcome back to another True Crime Mysteries video. Thank you all for being here. Today we're discussing four cases where nurses were caught committing murder. Let's get into it. Hospitals are supposed to be a safe place where one goes to get help, but for these four cases, it was used as an opportunity for terrible people to use their authority and medical expertise to harm those in their care. Number 1. Elizabeth Wetlaufer it was in September 2016 when Elizabeth Wetlaufer checked herself into the Center for Addiction and Mental Health Psychiatric Hospital in Toronto, Canada. The then 49-year-old registered nurse disclosed she was experiencing substance abuse issues. Recently, her addiction had been making it challenging to find work in the area. Her last job had discovered she had been stealing medication and using on the job. Wetlawfer had primarily spent the last decade working night shifts in senior care facilities, so it had come to a shock when she confessed to her therapist that while she'd been a nurse, she had killed and attempted to kill multiple patients. Disturbingly, her therapist didn't really believe her confessions at first, or found them unreliable. Wetlawfer wrote a four-page confession detailing how and why she had murdered eight and attempted to murder six more patients during her career as a nurse, and it was at that point that her therapist alerted law enforcement and also the governing body for nurses in Ontario. An initial investigation confirmed that Wetlawfer had faced multiple suspensions and terminations from various facilities for medication-related errors when it was discovered that she had given the incorrect medication to patients. Despite these errors that had resulted in terminations, it hadn't been enough to revoke her nursing license. She completed her rehab program and her therapist convinced her to go to the Toronto Police and confess which she did on October 5th, 2016. She spent over two hours with a detective, walking him through her murder spree, which began in 2007 after the divorce from her husband of 11 years. She described being filled with anger about her life, her job, her marriage. She expressed disappointment in never having children because her husband didn't want kids. She detailed that her ex-husband had been a quote-unquote bad guy and that had made her angry. Elizabeth Wetlaufer had grown up in a religious household. She was deeply involved in her Baptist church and had originally gotten a bachelor's degree in religious education counseling, but quickly discovered there wasn't a lot of money or opportunities in that field and opted to go back to school to study nursing. When asked why she had killed, she had first acknowledged that she had an unchecked substance abuse issue and had been stealing medications from patients, but also said that she felt, quote, God or the devil or whatever wanted me to do it, and revealed that she never premeditated any of her attacks and she simply stated that she got a feeling and acted on it. Many of her victims had slighted her in some way. Sometimes they'd been rude to her or someone else, sometimes they were just difficult to take care of, but something would happen that would trigger her feeling and she would grab insulin and directly inject the patient. Her victims ranged in ages from 68 to 96, and because they were elderly, none of the victims had autopsies, and they were all listed as natural causes. Had she not confessed, her crimes would have never been caught. They were not mercy killings, as some have reported. All of the victims could have gone on to live many more years. Wetlawfer herself did not say that they were mercy killings, but rather expressed that it was an anger or frustration or a belief that they were a bad person that led to the decision to take their lives. She revealed that she would get a euphoric feeling after successfully killing a patient. And her confession to her therapist hadn't been the first. She confessed to a childhood friend, her cousin, a neighbor, a lawyer, her pastor and his wife, and an ex-girlfriend. During her confession to law enforcement, the detective asked why she thought no one had gone to the police about her confessions. And she said that she thought no one believed her, which she found frustrating. Sorry about that. That's okay. There's too many people moving and shaking around here, but you can't really keep track of who's doing what. So, um, so yeah, like I said, um, I'm, I'm just going to go through for everything in this room is audio and video recorded first right. off. Are you okay, okay with that? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, I just want to go through, like I said, a couple formalities, cover a few little things off, things that I have to do on my end that I, I, I right. need to do, 
and uh, things that I just want to tell you and make sure that we're all on the same page before we uh, before we get going. Okay. Okay. So first off, um, today is Wednesday, October the fifth, two thousand and sixteen, and on my phone right now, I'll just use that as a, a time reference. It's five fourteen. Okay. So seventeen fourteen. We'll just use that as a start time of our conversation here today. Um, again, my name is Nathan Hergott with the Woodstock Police Service. I currently work in our crime unit. Okay. And uh, we met a short time ago in downtown Toronto, correct? Yes. Right. Yeah. So um, we came to a facility where you've spent the last uh, few weeks, from what I understand. Yeah. And uh, we met with Dr. Khan and, yes. and his team of uh, associates, yeah. and I believe you're under his care for the last little while, correct? Yeah, for the last three weeks. Okay. And uh, the process, how, how we got here basically is um, kind of offered you a ride back, and, and so we could have this conversation, and, and you gracefully accepted, and uh, off we went down uh, the 401, or the, well, the, the gardener, the QW, yeah. and the 403, and, and, and here we are. Right. Um, so just to make it clear for whoever might watch this in the future, um, we didn't force you to come with us. We didn't, uh, you know, shove you in the car and off we went kind of thing. You did it yeah. on your own free will and, and you accepted it on your own uh, on your own decision making. Yeah. Is that no. correct? Yep. Yeah. I had enough and you even let me try to give money to the homeless people. So. There you go. I remember all of that. I remember all that. So I, I know I read you a few things before um, as we were kind of just cruising down Spadina there. Um, and I know you've been read this many times, but it's just things that we need to just reiterate and, and make sure that you're clear and comfortable with, okay. with having this conversation today. Okay. Okay. Um, like I said, um, based on our investigation, there could be some, some pretty serious criminal charges that result of, yeah. of our investigation. Okay. Yeah. So having said that, if, if you wish to speak to a lawyer at any time, okay. I don't want you to hesitate. We can make it happen whenever you like. So okay. whether it's now, five minutes from now, an hour from now, or three days from now, whatever the case may be. We're not going to be asking questions for three days, are we? I hope not. I hope <laughs> okay. I'm, just, I'm just saying that any time that you want to speak to a lawyer, that you're kind of in our company or whatever the case may be, you let us know and, and we can make that accommodation for okay. you. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah. Okay, because you, in your position uh, as a Canadian citizen, you, uh, you're entitled to have free legal advice from a legal aid Okay. Uh, duty counsel lawyer, a lawyer of your choice, whoever you like. Okay. Make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, and, and like I said, because there could be some criminal charges that, that result of our investigation. Right. Okay. Um, also, and, and I know you've been read this many times before, that you may be charged uh, with many criminal offenses, um, and you don't have to say anything in answer to the charges that you face. But if you wish to do so, um, we're going to do that today. Um, but whatever you do say could be used in, in court. And I know we had that conversation in the car on the way, on the yeah. way uh, back to Woodstock. Yeah. And I asked you to repeat it in your own words, and you kind of gave us a few uh, a few of, of describing it in your own vocabulary. As you said something like, it's not Vegas. What happens in the car on the way back doesn't necessarily stay in the car. Right? Yeah. So okay. same, thing, same thing in this room. Anything that you okay. say and everything that we talked about could be used as evidence at court. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So kind of to put it easily, the same rules apply. Okay. okay. Um, and if you've spoken to any other police officers, I know that you've dealt with uh, the Toronto police Toronto, officers. Yeah. Uh, there was uh, a couple officers in the car on our on our trip back here. Um, if anyone's persuaded you or tried to push you into making a statement, whatever they said, I don't want that to influence no. you in any way. Okay. No, what I'm about to that. say is, is I'm giving up my own free will. Okay. All right. And I appreciate that. Um, and we'll get moving forward. For another few things, and I know that we said this in the car, you are not under arrest right now. Okay. Okay, I want to make that very clear to you. Okay. Okay, you're not under arrest. The door is unlocked. Okay, I'm not impeding your way to the door. If you want to leave at any time, if you want to stop talking to me at any time, you just let me know, and, okay. uh, and we'll just carry on from there. Okay. Okay, but you're not being held here against your will. Uh, we're not yeah. forcing you to speak to us. Um, we just have some follow-up, some uh, some follow-up questions from the investigation that kind of okay. got going while you were in Toronto. Yeah, being interviewed is hard because it takes so long. It does. Um, so I'll do my best. Like, if, like I said, if I have to get up and pace around a bit or whatever. If you want to take a break at any time, you let us know. If you want to get up and pace around, I'll just kind of hang tight here and yeah. we'll just keep conversing as long as uh, as long as you're comfortable. Um, I'll go as long as I can. Okay. All right. Sounds good. 
Um, that's kind of all the formalities, but but like I said, those are the, the things that I just wanted to make sure that were, were clear to you. And if you have any questions for me before we get started, <coughs> the floor is yours. Is there no. anything or any concerns that you have? No, I just I want to get through this and find out what happened to my mom and dad because I know they're upset because someone went to visit them today. Okay. And they visited them today and they said, you know, they're here, we're concerned, what's going on? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I can imagine. I can imagine that, and I honestly don't have those answers for you, okay. but I can get them for you. Um, okay. My role in this investigation so far has been not as in-depth as some of the other officers, um, okay. but my, my task today obviously was to travel to Toronto and, and meet with you with, with my fellow co-workers yeah. and, uh, and come back here and, and have a conversation. So that's kind of where, where I'm at right now. But I can definitely get those okay. answers for you, and, and I don't want to upset any more people that need to be, uh, especially your mom and dad. Okay. You should have bought blue, t blue tickets when you were there. You know what? If I could afford them for the playoffs, I probably would have. Yeah, that was exciting last night. Um, so just just for the record, and I know you, you prefer to go by Beth is what you told yes. me. Is that correct? Yes. Can you just state your full name for me? Elizabeth Tracy May Wettwasser. Tracy May? Yeah. Okay, and just spell your last name for the record. W-E-T-T-L-A-U-S-E-R. Perfect. Um, and Beth, the reason why we're here today is because uh, we received some information uh, back at the end of last week um, with regards to um, some information that was provided to the Toronto Police Service, mm -hmm. um, which has led us into uh, quite a bit of work and, and leads us here today to speak to you with regards to kind of how this all started and, and yeah. follow up. But basically, um, I've, I've watched your statement that you provided to Toronto. Okay. Okay. And we've been provided uh, this document here. Does that look familiar to yeah, you? Yes, exactly. Okay. All right. And from what I can see here, there's four pages of uh, a handwritten document. Is that your handwriting? Yes, it is. Okay. And it just kind of goes through um, some people that you've encountered in, in your career uh, from 2007 through to 2016 of August, yeah. uh, August of 2016. Okay. So, so that's kind of the... The focus of our investigation right now is right. the information that you you put on these four pieces of paper. Yes. Okay. Um, but but before we get into that, I just want to kind of get an idea of, of your career and, and where you kind of where you've been in your career and um, kind of how you got into things and. Registered nurse. I started from call. I started from with from uh, here in Park uh, Secondary School. I. Um, <coughs> okay. I graduated. Grade 13, went for a year of law school, not law school, sorry, journalism school. Okay. And uh, then uh, went to uh, Bible College, yeah. London Baptist Bible College in London. Graduated with a degree in uh, counseling, with a bachelor's degree in counseling. Mm -hmm. And then um, discovered that that's not going to be really going to get me a lot far as work-wise and career-wise, and so I went back to uh, here in Park High School for a year, and I took a year of math and sciences, and went on to um, Conestoga College, and, and uh, they have, it's in Kitchener, but they have Stratford campus, so I went there for the three years, okay. and then when I graduated there, I worked in a place called Geraldton. Okay. Which is 16 hours north of uh, Toronto. I was gonna say that's quite a bit north, isn't it? Three hours north of Thunder Bay. Yeah, that's way up there. Yeah. Um, worked there. Couldn't stand the isolation. Moved back. Worked for um, an organization called uh, Christian Horizons here in town in one of their group homes till 2007. Um, at which time. Um, my marriage fell apart in February 2007, and uh, I met a woman online, and she decided to move to be with me. Okay. So um, I ended up quitting the job I was at and going to correct and care to make a little bit more money because I was the only pregnant earner. Mm -hmm. So I started working at correct and care, um, I believe it was June 2007. And how long did you work there for? 
until um, 2014. Yeah, till uh, like I think it was March 2014. And were you always in the same role? Or as did a, you as a different role as person care? I was a registered nurse. Yeah. And registered nurses' role is always the same. Yeah. But um, I worked in different areas of the home. Okay. There's five wings to correctional care, so I worked in different areas. Right. Okay. All throughout the, the seven or so years that you were there? Yes. Okay. And at that point, did you have different supervisors from unit to unit or? Uh, no, was there, was, the same person or? there was one supervisor, Helen Crombie, she was the head nurse. Okay. And then there was like people under her, um, Shelly, uh, Jeanette, um, I don't remember the rest of them. And then there was like a, an administrative head. And I think for most of that time it was Brenda. Right. Okay. Um, and then from Crest Care, I know you've, you've had a few other. Yeah, I went from Crest and Care, fired from Crest and Care. Okay. For a medication area, era, okay. er, error. Yeah. Then from there I went to uh, Meadow Park Nursing Home. Okay. And uh, left there to get help with an um, addiction issue. Okay. Hoping that it would get help with that as well. Mm-hmm. And then when I came back, I started working again in January. I left, I left Meadow Park in uh, September of 2014, and I started working for a um, nursing agency called uh, Lifeguard in 2015, and I worked with them for over a year, and then in July 2016, I started working for St. Elizabeth's Healthcare. Okay. As well, I was still working for um, Lifeguard. Oh, okay. And how did that work? Did you just split your time between the two, um, or was it just kind of a part-time position at both organizations? It was, St. Elizabeth was my priority. Okay. So, and Lifeguard is very much, you pick up the shifts as they come. There's very few scheduled shifts, so gotcha. I can say the yes and no to them and, and focus on St. Elizabeth. And were, and were those roles where you would do, like, in-home care with different um, clients? With uh, Lifeguard, it's an agency, so you go into nursing homes, you go into people's homes, you go into um, you go into uh, like retirement homes. Um, you did a lot of different things, a lot of one-on-ones with people, mm-hmm. like in their own homes, mm-hmm. twelve-hour shifts, eight-hour shifts, okay. sitting with them. Okay. A lot of stuff I did was sitting with palliative patients. Right. Okay. That would be tough. I, hey, it was okay. Yeah. Like, because mm-hmm. I knew they were going to die. Yeah. And it was just an opportunity to give the family a rest. Yeah, absolutely. So. Yeah, it's an important role. I mean, a lot of people wouldn't see it that way and wouldn't even notice the care that these people are giving from people like yourself, right? Um, yeah. So we give the families a bit of a break and, and take, take, take that role as, as important, which a lot of people don't see, right? Because so. when, some, when someone's dying in the house, mm-hmm. Families don't want everyone to be asleep at once, right? And that can be right. very hard if you're not able to do that. That's right. But if you have a nurse there that says, no, it's okay, I've got this, I know the medications they get, it's going to be all right, then... Everyone kind of rest easy. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, back at Metal Park, what, were you, what was your addiction? Uh, hide and rest. Okay. All right. Hide and rest. Okay. And what, like, how much were you using? And I was a binge user, so okay. I would use what I could get a hold of okay. by stealing it from the patients. Okay. All right. And how would that work? Like, would, it, would it just be in their, in their allotted medications, or would you have access to a card to, um, to feed your patient? There, there, <clears throat> there are some of their allotted medications. Some of them had um, confusion, so they couldn't tell the difference between what pills you were giving them, so I could give them a lot to do it instead of their hiding more. Okay. Um, there was, uh, a lot of them had as needed, so it would be in a big card, mm-hmm. and then they'd say, I would just punch out that, oh, Barney needed two of those today, and oh, Billy needed three of those today, when they really didn't. Okay. 
and that's how I would get a hold of it. Okay. Every once in a while, there was also a um, drug book, dr big drug uh, holder, like a safe almost, that we would put the drugs in. Okay. Once uh, they could, somebody dies, yeah. and there were like 23 hydromorphs left, we'd slide the whole card into the drug holder. Well, if you picked it up and turned it upside down and shook it, you'd get drugs back out of it. In total, Elizabeth Wetlofer confessed to killing eight patients with insulin and attempting to kill six more. She had confessed because she had realized during her sobriety and bipolar diagnosis that there had been no higher power that was guiding her, but that she was hurting people and wanted to be stopped because she could not be stopped on her own. After her confession, she was released on the promise that she would not leave town while Toronto police worked to gather evidence to confirm her story. On October 25, 2016, she was arrested. Wetlawfer waived her right to a preliminary hearing and admitted to her crimes to a judge on June 2017. She was sentenced to eight concurrent life terms in prison and will not be eligible for parole until 2042. A public inquiry was started in 2017 by the Attorney General of Ontario to put measures in place to stop this from happening again. Number 2. Charles Cullen now this case is incredibly disturbing, and not just because of the heinous acts carried out by this sick individual, but that multiple medical institutions that never reported their suspicions to the authorities. Their inaction led to countless more deaths, which makes this even more shocking how he got away with this for 16 years. It was in September 2002 when Somerset Medical Center in Somerville, New Jersey, brought on 42-year-old Charles Cullen. Cullen was a veteran nurse who had been working for many hospitals over an almost 20-year career. No one really questioned why he'd moved from so many hospitals. Cullen was divorced with two children and blamed the moves on his ex-wife and him wanting to be closer to his kids, which all seemed like a reasonable excuse. When the hospital checked in with many of his previous employers, they all gave neutral or positive feedback. Cullen worked in the critical care unit and by all accounts seemed like an attentive, hard-working nurse who worked well with his co-workers. However, when he started working there, the hospital started noticing more patient deaths than was normal, and many of them had been stable when they all of a sudden had very sudden declines in health. An internal audit of several patient deaths led to the involvement of the New Jersey State Police. Toxicology reports determined that multiple patients had medications in their systems that hadn't been prescribed to them, such as insulin, a heart medication called digoxin, and epinephrine. Somerset ultimately fired Cullen on October 31, 2003 for a small HR issue. They claimed he had lied on his application. After he was fired, the mysterious death stopped, and the hospital seemed to drop the internal investigation. However, the NJSP still pursued the wrongful deaths. A co-worker who had worked closely with Cullen for almost a year, Amy Lauren, agreed to work with law enforcement to better understand what was going on. Hospital records showed that Cullen was accessing the same medications that had been found in the victim's toxicology reports. Amy recounted seeing Cullen administer medications to patients that weren't assigned to him, and although it had seemed odd, she had never thought anything sinister about the interaction. Cullen's history with other hospitals also started to come to light. He had been abruptly terminated by nearly every hospital he worked at, but law enforcement had a hard time determining why. Many of the hospitals weren't forthcoming about Cullen's time as an employee. Cullen went to nursing school in 1986 after a short career in the U.S. Navy led to a medical discharge. He worked at the St. Barnabas Medical Center from 87 to 92. He had resigned abruptly when an internal investigation showed that contaminated IV bags had led to dozens of patient deaths. The hospital at the time strongly believed Cullen to be connected to the contaminations, but claimed they didn't have definitive proof. He then moved on to Warren Hospital in Phillipsburg, where he worked for a year. There, three elderly patients were discovered to have digoxin in their systems, and the final victim had told a family member that a sneaky male nurse had injected her with medication, but the claim had been dismissed and she had died shortly after under mysterious circumstances. 
He then moved on to seven more institutions, each lasting about a year or two before he moved on to the next one. As the police pieced together a framework of his employment history and tied it with a string of mysterious deaths, they were able to collect enough evidence to begin surveillance. Many of his victims were already in critical condition, elderly, or in poor health. Because of this, a lot of the deaths could be explained away as either coincidence or accident. But there were at least two hospitals that had directly linked Cullen to medications that had caused a patient death. In 1998, he was fired from a rehab center for administering medications to patients that hadn't been prescribed that had caused a death. A group of nurses that worked on the same floor as Cullen's at St. Luke's had attempted to get him charged in 2002, but the case was dropped due to lack of evidence. Law enforcement used his friendship with Amy Lauren to get enough evidence to arrest. Why did you decide to participate with the investigators and essentially you ended up getting him behind bars? I don't think that there was any other way. I really, um, I, I did know after I started working on the investigation that until we could put the syringe in his hand, until we could truly put him next to the patients that were dying, there was no possible way that we were going to be able to convict him or get him behind bars. and. All of those, the paperwork, all of uh, the medical records, it's a language that if you don't speak it, it's, it's just, it's such a foreign language and it's so harsh. And I really felt like I was the only person that could really see what was happening with him. Wearing a wire, Amy attempted to get him to confess, but he didn't admit enough for a full arrest. They did arrest him before they had enough evidence, and he later confessed to killing two patients at Somerset, which was enough to charge him. Cullen later agreed to confess to as many murders as possible in order to avoid the death penalty. He'd stated he'd been too many to count, and he claimed to have murdered around 40, but couldn't remember names. Law enforcement was able to identify 29 victims, but stated that there could be hundreds of victims that were never identified. Not all the hospitals had accurate records, some had destroyed records during Cullen's employment, and the deaths that weren't suspicious were never flagged. Cullen never said why he did what he did. At some point during his confessions, he stated he was helping patients, but at other points he admitted to watching patients suffer for days because of what he did. He seemed to act impulsively, either directly or indirectly. Sometimes he used contaminated IV bags, sometimes he injected the patients himself. There were additional methods that weren't revealed to the media. He pleaded guilty on March 2, 2006. He was sentenced to 11 consecutive life sentences. In the wake of his conviction, many of the hospitals were sued by victims' relatives, which resulted in several settlements that remained sealed. In 2005, New Jersey enacted new legislation called the Enhancement Act, which gave stiffer requirements for hospitals to report suspicious deaths and keep employee records pertaining to complaints and disciplinary relating to patient care for at least seven years. Number 3. Lucy Letby This case is currently in front of the courts in the UK, where it started on October 10th and is estimated to continue for six months. As such, the information in this case is ongoing, but this is what we know so far. Starting in 2015, the Countess of Chester Hospital in Chester, England, began experiencing a sharp increase in infant mortalities in their neonatal intensive care unit. Initially, they could not figure out what was going on, but it became so bad that in 2016, they stopped taking in premature infants and transferred them to nearby hospitals. A report found that the hospital had a death rate that was 10% higher than normal. What was worse was that there wasn't a single cause or factor that was causing these deaths. In 2017, law enforcement was brought in when multiple reviews and audits were unable to determine what was going on. Through hospital records, there was only one common denominator between 15 unexplained infant deaths and 17 life-threatening incidents between June 2015 to June 2016. 
There was one single employee present for each of the incidents that had been determined to be suspicious. 32-year-old nurse Lucy Leppi. Leppi had worked for the hospital since 2011 and had been removed from the neonatal ward in 2016, moved to clerical duties while the hospital worked towards solving the strange incidents. When Leppi was removed from the ward, the unexplained deaths that had plagued the neonatal ward had all but stopped. For a year, the hospital and law enforcement worked to gather as much information about the deaths, which were eventually determined to be murder and attempted murder, and eventually concluded that only one person had been there for every incident, Lucy Letby. Through autopsies, they found some infants had been given insulin in lethal amounts. An audit done by the hospital concluded that access to insulin was supposed to remain locked by the lead nurse. However, it was discovered that the keys were often given to anyone who needed access when the lead nurse was busy. Leppy also had been caught having more mistakes than normal for a nurse with her experience. She was discovered to have not noticed there was air in an injection. Some parents had even connected the dots that it was the hospital when many of them compared stories about their infants going into sudden distress around the same time. Though they had never assumed it was a person causing it, they had thought it was a virus going around, and many asked to be transferred to another hospital. Leppi was arrested on July 3, 2018 and charged with 8 counts of murder and 10 counts of attempted murder. Following her arrest, her home was searched and they found this note, which seems to admit guilt. There are no words, I am an awful person, I will never marry, I will never have children. I don't deserve to live, I killed them on purpose because I'm not good enough. I am evil, I did this. There were more notes, and detectives stated that these were on post-it notes, filled like this, all over her home. Some of the notes expressed frustration that she'd been removed from neonatal service and wasn't allowed access to the ward anymore. Leppi has pleaded not guilty to all counts. During the trial, it was also revealed that two employees came to the hospital before the internal investigation with concerns about Leppi's care. However, at the time, they were dismissed and told not to make a fuss. One of these employees was a pediatrician who had been monitoring her when he noticed these things happening only when she was on shift. The trial has protected the families involved. There is a publication ban so that none of the families or the children's identities will be revealed during trial. There are still many more months of trial left, and there likely won't be a verdict until spring 2023. Letby has been held in police custody since her arrest. If convicted, she will spend the rest of her life behind bars. Number 4. Jonathan Howard Hayes 47-year-old Jonathan Howard Hayes has worked in nursing for over 20 years, with 15 of those at Atrium Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. He had been nominated for a Nurse of Distinction Award by the North Carolina Nurses Associate for Outstanding Work. His wife, who also works as a doctor at Atrium, had been the one to nominate him. However, it has recently come to light that Jonathan Hayes has a dark secret, and he was arrested on October 25th. Suspicion began on December 1st, 2021, when 62-year-old Pamela Little came to the hospital. For reasons unbeknownst to the hospital, her health began to rapidly decline. They were able to stabilize the patient, and during an investigation, determined that the patient had been given a near-lethal dose of insulin. It was at this time that Atrium began an internal investigation to find out how it had happened under their care. During the investigation, there were two more deaths that initially hadn't seemed related, but they were able to determine that two women had been administered lethal doses of insulin. The first victim was 61-year-old Gwen Crawford, who died on January 5, 2022, the second was 62-year-old Vicki Lingerfeld, who died on January 22, 2022. Lethal doses of insulin, especially in seniors, usually results in heart failure and can easily go undetected. At this time, it is unclear what alerted the hospital to look for elevated insulin as the cause of death, but will likely be revealed in future court proceedings. By March 2022, the internal investigation by the hospital had led to the belief that Hayes had been responsible for the insulin overdoses, and Atrium alerted law enforcement with their suspicions and removed Hayes from patient care, and soon after, he was fired. 
the chief medical examiner came in and stated there was probable cause to charge Jonathan Hayes, and a search warrant of his home was conducted. At this time, we do not know what was found at the home, as the information has been sealed from the public until his trial. Forsyth County District Attorney Jim O'Neill said in a statement to the media addressing the arrest that they are still working to determine if there are more victims, but stated that they believe Hayes acted alone, no motives have been revealed, and Hayes has denied any wrongdoing. The nurse is called to the profession. They provide care, support, and love when we need it most. Doctors and nurses have put their own lives in jeopardy when they answered the call during the early days of the pandemic and showed up for work. They say that if you save one life, you're a hero. If you save a hundred lives, you're a nurse. Jonathan Hayes has forfeited the honor of being called a nurse. From this day forth, he'll be known as a defendant. Hayes is being held without bail while he waits further court proceedings. Let me know if you want updates on this case, including trial updates. Well, that is it for this video. As always, thank you so much for watching. If you like this content and want to do over here, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss my next upload. If you give this video a like, if you enjoyed the content, that would be much appreciated as it's the easiest way to help the channel grow. We also have channel membership as well as Patreon if you want to get more behind the scenes content or exclusive content or just to support the channel. In the description box of this video, you will also find links to all my socials to connect with me as well as other goodies. But that is it for me. Thank you so much for being here. I will see you all in the next one. Bye for now.